As Abraham Lincoln said in his immortal second inaugural address, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of coronavirus may speedily pass away. Actually, he said war rather than coronavirus. But if he were with us today, I'm sure he would say coronavirus. Thanks to that virus, we are forced to meet virtually rather than in person. Next year, we hope to resume meeting in person in Springfield as we normally do. So welcome to the virtual 2021 annual Benjamin P. Thomas Symposium of the Abraham Lincoln Association. I am Michael Burlingame, president of the association, which is most grateful to Benjamin Thomas's daughter, Sarah Thomas, for generously funding the symposium. Ben Thomas served as the executive secretary of the ALA and wrote several important books, most notably Abraham Lincoln, a biography, which since its publication in 1952 has been widely and justly considered the best single volume life of the 16th president. It was written in Thomas's limpid style and with a profound understanding of Lincoln and his times. Thomas was a civic minded and much admired resident of Springfield, as well as a distinguished scholar. We are fortunate this year to have as our speakers four authors who have recently published noteworthy books about the country's 16th president. The symposium will be divided into two parts with a pair of presentations today and another pair tomorrow morning, followed by an author's roundtable tomorrow afternoon. We normally provide an opportunity for our audience to buy copies of the speaker's books and have them autographed, but that is not possible this year. Their books are easily available for purchase online. If you have questions, please hold them until the uh, roundtable discussion tomorrow, which you can then, during which you can then submit them online. So without further ado, let's begin. Hello, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. I wish we could all be uh, together in person to talk about Abraham Lincoln, but I uh, am excited about this opportunity to share what I learned in some of my reporting for the book that I uh, came out with this year called Lincoln's Lie, A True Civil War Caper Through Fake News, Wall Street and the White House. Now, uh, the Lincoln that I'm going to talk about is uh, less of a Lincoln in uh, overall assessment than to show him in action in this particularly strange tale, uh, which will give us some insights into who he was um, just based on his response to the events uh, at hand. Now, I came across the story because I was doing reporting and investigating for my previous book, which was about the strange story of how the Statue of Liberty came to be. And in there, I found that the fundraising was done uh, by the, the world newspaper towards the end of the creation of the Statue of Liberty. And Joseph Pulitzer had bought the world at a cut rate price. Um, and part of the reason for that was because uh, the newspaper had been so uh, shamed by this incident back in 1864 when it ran a false proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln. Um, it went on to say that Abraham Lincoln had responded with such anger to this incident that he had sent military into the newspaper offices and arrested the newspaper editors. And that seemed to be so strikingly dramatic and sort of against what I had thought Abraham Lincoln to be that I decided to look into it further. I certainly had known his position on habeas corpus and his desire to suspend it during the time of the war. Um, but the kind of uh, impulsive fury and also this possible uh, problem with uh, freedom of the press was something that I had not understood before. So um, I want to share with you some images to help uh, uh, Sorry, to help uh, understand this story a little bit better. Um, okay, and sorry. Okay, so um, we're going to start with this image, which is just um, I like it because it sort of um, 
it speaks to the idea of rethinking Abraham Lincoln a little bit. And I, and then this story helped me uh, rethink him. Uh, it's all centered around May 18th, 1864. And so I'm going to give you a little background on what was going on right then. Um, first of all, the White House was up for grabs. It was a re-election year. And, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln was certainly the front runner for the um, Republican nomination, but it was by no means certain. Uh, there were other rivals, including his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon Chase, uh, who had uh, shown all sorts of ambitions in that regard. Um, and even Mary Todd Lincoln had warned her husband that he should be wary of Chase. And Chase had been somewhat shamed by the exposure of his ambition into giving up uh, the plan, but it still was not completely off the table. Um, there were other Republicans too who thought that uh, Abraham Lincoln wasn't taking a strong enough stand against slavery and um, at actually should be moving more quickly. And that, that sort of voice was out there as well. And then there was his Democrat um, rival who was George McClellan. And McClellan had been the darling of the press uh, back at the beginning of the war uh, when he won a few small victories for the Union side. But he showed this kind of um, reluctance to uh, engage more fully in battles to the point where Abraham Lincoln became furious with him, frustrated beyond belief at his uh, reluctance uh, to engage more more have, uh, heartily. And so he had fired him. And at this point in 1864, McClellan had now uh, taken some revenge by issuing a report uh, with the general accounting office of the Civil War. And in it, there were plenty of critiques of Abraham Lincoln's administration and uh, his conduct in the war. So the partisanship was extremely strong. It, here we see a, um, a rally of the uh, McClellan side at night, which probably was a slightly terrifying uh, you know, thing to come across. But um, also in the uh, papers of the time, the press was extremely partisan openly so in terms of there were editors who were leaders of you know one party or the other and uh they they would take their hits on uh abraham lincoln particularly when it came to um what was going on on the battlefield now right at the beginning of may there had been the battle of the wilderness and that had been such a strange uh you know conflict the the soldiers reported that they couldn't even see the other side when they were firing they would just sort of fire towards uh you know flares or flashes of uh light um there was smoke just through the dense forest and and they could you know just hear people crying out um but when it was all over the the casualty count was around twenty thousand. Um, and, and so it was this, uh, you know, the tragedy of, of the death toll coming back to the cities, um, particularly up north to New York City, um, were really terrifying the people. No one knew whether it meant that the war was going well or badly. And this had been, a, you know, such a long conflict, uh, conflagration already. There was the idea that Abraham Lincoln was not taking the death uh, toll seriously enough. Uh, here we have a cartoon, and and while uh, you know his his uh, aide is viewing the carnage, uh, Lincoln is asking for another funny song. Uh, Lincoln was known for his love of funny stories, both the ones he would tell and the ones that he would, uh, you know. Uh, convey written by others um and uh it was wondered did he was he really fully absorbing the horror of uh the body counts uh in these battles there was also the issue of the telegraph which was one of the things that i found more fascinating than almost anything else in my research was how much it was paralleling where we are today with our you know, social media and technology. The the telegraph at that time was had been around for about 30 years and it had gone from being something that was just used to send a sober message now and then about say the death of a relative. And now it was being used uh, 
constantly so that if you were at your home and you were planning to go to the theater and you wanted to change it to a dinner uh, date, you would do that by the telegraph. Um, there were just hundreds of offices, uh, you know, across, you know, the country, many, many within the city itself, the cities themselves, and then also out to the little towns and all the rest. And so it was, uh, uh, something that Abraham Lincoln, when he first took office, he would barely ever use it. Um, he would uh, send one message a, a month using an agent to run down to the commercial office in DC to send out the message. But uh, by the time, uh, you know, early on in his presidency, the telegraph got all put through the War Department. So all the wires were feeding through there and he would be able to go over and read the messages that had come through, whether they were meant for him or not. He would spend many hours a day there and he would often sleep at the telegraph office. And, uh, you know, the people were a little bit worried too. They were saying, well, if he has this power to communicate by telegraph, there's no editor in between and leaders, um, you know, have then the ability to uh, communicate like lightning at once to all the people. And it would sort of a terrifying power. Now this is Samuel Morse who invented the telegraph and he originally when he when he invented it thought this was going to be such a wonderful thing for the country that you know now it would be knit together by these wires where we would all understand you know each other's thoughts but then he realized that actually uh we were getting divided once we knew how different we were uh you know we could not paper over those differences anymore and information was coming so much more quickly so that you had sort of instant reactions to um, a political events and you know certainly what was going on on the battlefield he he actually tried to um, re-knit the country in his own way by uh, creating the society a society for the unification uh, of the United States and uh, it was not particularly successful one of his ideas was, everyone who had a complaint should basically give it up so that you know women who wanted the right to vote had to just stop <laughs> with their demands um different religious groups needed to put those aside um and and on and on and uh you know and so obviously the country uh being as diverse as it was in all ways um was not able to um just abandon their their hopes and dreams so um, the other thing that I found very interesting that's pertinent to this story is that Abraham Lincoln was a big player of the press. And here's a cartoon of the time showing him, you know, mixing up a cocktail for the New York press. Uh, he started even back in Illinois um, as a lawyer, being someone who would put, you know, an anonymous letter into the newspapers critiquing someone he was going up against in court. He also, at one point, uh, wrote under the pen name Rebecca. Um, this is some, a story that some of you already may know, but I'll just go through it for those who don't. But he he uh, he wrote uh, criticizing one of his political opponents who had who wanted a different banking system in Illinois, and so he 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 goes after him in this pseudonym of Rebecca to the point where he's actually calling into question uh, whether this uh, man is a philanderer or not. Uh, the man in question was so uh, furious at this characterization that he tracks down who, who wrote the letters and Abraham Lincoln admits that it was him. Uh, and then he's challenged to a duel. They go, they go to fight the duel and Abraham Lincoln is allowed to choose the weapons and he chooses broadswords. So when this opponent, uh, James Shields, sees Abraham Lincoln testing out the weapon on the trees above, he realizes that Lincoln has the advantage with his arm span. And so he gives up the duel at that moment. But you know, Abraham Lincoln uh, learns an interesting lesson, which is he never had to actually uh, go back and say what he had written was a lie uh, or you know made up in any way. He just carries on from there, and so that kind of conduct with the press um, continues at, at going into the eighteen sixty election. He uh, goes and he buys a newspaper in the center of the country that was a German language newspaper. Now he knew that the German 
uh, American vote was going to be extremely important in that election. So buying the newspaper under a secret contract allowed him to dictate that the paper uh, would not say anything against the Republican platform. And so uh, he therefore has this uh, sort of great outlet of information into the demographic that he most needs. As he's going to his inaugural, uh, some of his aides are actually writing under uh, pseudonyms or anonymously to the press saying very favorable things about Abraham Lincoln. And this is, uh, you know, these are some images from that famous 13 day train trip to the inaugural um, in which he has embedded reporters. Uh, the idea is he's going to go show himself to the American people. He's going to meet the local legislators and he is going to make friends with the press uh, along the way, uh, which will serve him very well uh, when he is in DC. But on the way, there are death threats and they start from the very beginning of the trip. But uh, when he gets to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, there is a report that someone is going to try to assassinate him in Baltimore. And his bodyguard, uh, Ward Lamont, is one of the people urging him just to uh, get out of the entourage and travel by himself in cover of night to DC uh, ahead of the rest of the group. This is actually Ward Lamont's um, brass knuckles, which are at the Ford Theater. So, uh, Abraham Lincoln agrees to that, but there's one problem, which is he has these embedded reporters along for the train travel. And so Joseph Howard was one of these reporters. Howard is quite a character. Um, he was very famous. He was uh, well-connected. He had been the assistant to Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who was the most famous preacher of the time, preaching out of the Plymouth Church in Brooklyn. And Beecher was a good friend of, uh, an admirer of Abraham Lincoln's. Um, Joseph Howard knew not only Beecher, but he knew the showgirls in the theater district. He knew the powerful politicians. Um, and he was considered a Republican. Um, he had started a Republican committee for young men in Brooklyn. And uh, he was a bit of a, um, he was a bit irreverent, let's say. Um, one of the reasons he was such a popular journalist was because he wrote in this very casual, funny way about incidents that usually had a lot of pomp and circumstance to them. So uh, people trusted him to tell them the real deal on what was happening uh, at any, you know, event he covered. Um, and he, he would, you know, put himself into the story more often than not. You know, if you went to cover something at the battlefields, he would talk to you about his calluses on his ankles or what have you. Um, and so anyhow, he was, he was along for this journey. Now, when he gets word that he's being locked in his hotel room in Harrisburg and uh, is given no information on why that is, he gets incensed. And so he demands to know uh, why he's being kept and is told in the end by this agent of um, the government that, uh, or an agent helping Abraham Lincoln, that, you know, Lincoln has gone under cover of night to DC. So Howard can't file his story till the morning, but he has all night to work on it. So he starts thinking and he comes up in his imagination with this idea that Abraham Lincoln, in order not to be, uh, you know, recognized on his journey, is wearing a very dramatic um, military cape and a tiny little scotch cap on his head. And this is how he's goes undetected because otherwise Abraham Lincoln is such a dramatic looking figure, you know, of course everyone would notice him. So he puts that into his New York Times story the next day and the cartoonists go crazy with it. Um, so do other newspapers and they just start making a mockery of Abraham Lincoln because here he was going up and standing in front of the crowds and giving these beautiful speeches, you know, short and not necessarily full of content, but beautiful. Um, but then when he's heading into the more, you know, treacherous states, he is in this crazy disguise. And so they just keep going with cartoons of him in this uh, unusual outfit. And so the newspapers get even more intense with it in terms of saying he's a laughing stock and that he deserves all kinds of abuse for his, um, you know, his cowardice. 
And Abraham Lincoln, uh, according to Ward Lamont, later tells him he greatly regretted that he had snuck into DC in this way because it left him open to ridicule. And certainly Howard was a big factor in that ridicule. And so uh, you would think that given that he could see that Joseph Howard was the person who wrote that and knowing that that's not what he wore going into DC, that Howard would somehow be you know, cast away um, from the White House so that he wouldn't be welcomed back. But instead, you know, he's there for the inaugural. He's um, then brought along for special trips to, you know, uh, see Abraham Lincoln confer with a former general right at his elbow, hearing his jokes, you know, getting the inside story. Uh, and so he's, he's very much a welcome part of the uh, White House coverage. So, now we're on May 18th, 1864, and this is Newspaper uh, Row, which was uh, Printer's Row, actually, at that time. Um, this is where all the big newspapers were collected, and they were not only big in New York, um, they would be circulated by train and ship and, uh, you know, and even stories would be telegraphed out to the you know hinterlands uh of what new york reporters had discovered so it was a big power center there was a lot of money being made here and uh you know everyone was abraham lincoln was very interested in making sure he had uh you know, links to the more powerful uh editors here's the new york times uh building and these were the three main editors the most powerful at that time Horace Greeley, Henry Raymond, and James Gordon Bennett. So on May 18th, 1864, around 3 a.m., there's a young boy. This is not the illustration. This is just to give you a sense of the drama. But a young 17-year-old boy is running through the streets uh, in the dark, delivering a proclamation from the president. It's on Associated Press paper. Uh, and he's trying at all the Associated Press uh, newspapers. And uh, the, the proclamation says that the country's in such terrible shape right now in terms of the war effort that the, um, you know, the battles are going worse than ever anyone could expect. And that uh, basically the country needs to, at this point, just pray for mercy from God um and fast in, in order to show the uh you know the desire for god's mercy and that there need to be four hundred thousand more men to report to the front immediately or abraham lincoln will very quickly begin a new draft now this is the proclamation a piece of it that's held at the chicago uh history museum the historical society's uh library holdings um and uh you know one of the things that really convinced people was that it was on the special paper and it was in the handwriting of an associated press uh agent now a draft is not just sad news in terms of the horror of the idea that more loved ones are going to the battlefield it also in new york meant the threat of horrible violence on the streets uh just a year earlier there had been the draft riots that had sparked when abraham lincoln had to give up the idea of an entirely volunteer uh union force and instead uh require that people show up to duty and so when that went got underway the uh white working class citizens of New York rebelled. And it was one of the worst examples of um, carnage uh, to be meted out. And it was really in a way a race war. Uh, there were, they, the, the gangs would roam through the city, setting fires, uh, beating up anyone they could find, including they actually beat up Joseph Howard as well, pretty terribly. Um, and they were killing people, including lynching many uh, African Americans who were just want, you know, on their way home from their jobs. Uh, they would lynch them and then mutilate the bodies afterwards. It was horrific. It went on for five days and ultimately had to be put down by uh, military coming back from the front. So everyone was afraid something like that could happen if, um, you know, with a draft that came at the wrong time. <clears throat> 
And this proclamation was, you know, saying really dire things like this country should be, it, you know, it's why God let this country be the scene of unparalleled outrage, um, the monumental sufferer of the 19th century. Um, and he's calling for citizens from the ages of 18 to 45. That's younger than the previous draft. Uh, and, you know, so people started gathering at the, uh, you know, around the draft offices. Um, they also were gathering on street corners. There was quite an uproar that morning that the news first broke. It was picked up by these two newspapers, you know, the World and the Journal of Commerce. The other newspapers had uh, been closed to, uh, or there had been some a foreman on duty who had decided, you know, not to run it or um, an editor who, you know, at the last minute decided not to run it. But these two major newspapers ran it. And so, you know, the the stock market went a little crazy at the beginning of the day and and gold shot up. Um, the reason gold shot up is because it was the one thing that could be counted on no matter what happened to the union. The union had its greenbacks, which were the, you know, basically the dollars um, which were had at the beginning of their being issued had the possibility that you could go and exchange them for gold at a, after waiting a certain amount of time but then uh by the, the end of 1861 the secretary of the treasury said no now it's divorced um the the alignment is divorced and so therefore gold is now a commodity and the greenback is just in sway to whatever you know the value the the basically the prediction of whether the union's going to stay solvent or not because if the union stays solvent then you can definitely bring that you know that greenback will always have value but if it collapses then it has no value and gold is going to have the value so there was a lot of um you know here's a here's an to me an amazing photo of uh wall street in 1864 and uh, so, so what you have is, you know, Manhattan, which we see here, you know, and uh, and in that little center pocket of green is City Hall, and then a, a, a line lining down uh, to the south are the newspapers of Newspaper Row, and then you have a little bit further down where you see that building that looks like the Parthenon, <laughs> that's uh, Wall Street, and then uh, all the way down at the tip, you have the ships, um, you know, which some of which, you know, a couple a week would head out over to Europe and they would be bringing information of what was going on in the war and, um, you know, the possibilities of union success. So information would be often, you know, uh, sent up from the battlefield uh, to DC. Uh, from DC, it would often go to the stock market. There were people on the Capitol, on Capitol Hill who would use the information that they found out about the war um, to make bets on gold or other commodities. And so people were making fortunes off of information. And they are also making fortunes sometimes off of misinformation. Um, stories would be planted just simply to move the market for a brief period of time so someone could cash in. You know, they buy gold uh, low and then sell it when it went high. And uh, and so this was this conduit of information, you know, uh, both true and untrue into Manhattan. And then the uh, if it managed to get on one of these boats going over to Europe, the repercussions were intense because basically, you know, if the the European uh, governments wanted to recognize the Confederacy because they just wanted to get business moving, and uh, so they there had been a moment, you know, a couple of years earlier where Reverend Henry Ward Beecher went over and pled Lincoln's case of you know to to wait and hope for a Union victory, um, and was he managed to be successful in getting them to wait, but they were anxious to move. So if this proclamation goes on the Scotia, for example, which was waiting to go out at noon that day, um, the information over in Europe would wreak havoc. Now, uh, you know, there were spies afoot at that time. This is one of Bell Boyd, who was one of the most famous uh, Confederate spies. Um, and, 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 you know, people were worried about uh, was information being planted uh, just to, you know, help ruin the union cause. Now, down in DC, according to one um, 
uh, eyewitness, allegedly Abraham Lincoln went into the worst fury of his presidency. And he was known to get furious. So this was, uh, this was a big deal. Um, his first uh, act was to, uh, to go and shut down, first to go check at the War Department if the telegram, the, a telegram had been sent from there with this information in it, in this false proclamation. Then he sent his favorite uh, telegraph agent and a little military contingent over to the DC independent telegraph office and shut down their offices and seized all of the telegrams in it. And then he issued this. This is an order um, regarding the two newspapers that ran the proclamation. And he's saying it was wickedly and traitorously printed. Uh, it is false and spurious. It's of a treasonable nature. And at that point, while you could get a lesser sentence, treason had the death penalty as its ultimate punishment. So he orders forthwith to arrest and imprison in any fort or military prison, the editors, proprietors, and publishers of the aforesaid newspapers. And he wanted them arrested and held in close custody and their military, their newspaper offices held by military force. So this is not specifically one of the uh, men who went and took custody of these newspaper offices, but it shows you the fixed bayonets. And, um, you know, I found these incredible and not anecdotes, but accounts of what it was like to have the military suddenly show up in the newspaper offices. Some put guns to the heads of the editors. Um, there were editors pleading and trying to almost trick the uh, military uh, forces to keep them from uh, taking custody. Uh, they, you know, the military seized the uh, notebooks of a guy who had just come back as a reporter from the front. Um, they, uh, you know, terrified the editors with this idea that they might have to part from their families never to see them again. And, uh, you know, this is a picture of Secretary of, a cartoon of Secretary of War Stanton, and he was known to, you know, act aggressively. And so this is a cartoon of him uh, suspending operations. This is uh, an, an order uh, telling that the president wants the arrest of these main, you know, famous editors uh, in New York City. But the thing is, those newspaper editors had thought they were doing the right thing. They um, they actually thought, uh, you know, they, they were on staff right at that moment. They were back home. But when they came back to the newspapers, they didn't know. It seemed to them they had done the right thing. The only indication that uh, that their newspapers had been in the wrong was the fact that there were throngs of people outside the newspaper offices. And so um, but their position was, you know, we get uh, proclamations from the president all the time. And if we didn't run them, we would be seen as being somehow, you know, trying to sabotage his efforts to lead. And so uh, eventually, as the investigation goes forward, uh, they, the, the detectives start to piece together, oh, this actually wasn't the newspaper editors. This was the act of Joseph Howard. Um, they find that Howard had a copy of this proclamation, um, you know, about a week before it ever appeared in the newspapers that he was talking about how he was going to make a killing uh, pretty soon on the market with uh, some new some information that was about to um, be unleashed. Uh, and so he is then sent off to Fort Lafayette Prison, which was a pretty a terrible uh, place to be held. Um, there were people said that if you went to Fort Lafayette, you just never got out because there were no uh, court dates or anything to, for this investigation. So, uh, you know, what you start to figure okay, what was the motivation there for Joseph Howard? He was a Republican as far as one could tell. So why did he want to damage Abraham Lincoln? That didn't really make any sense. Um, he did make mention of making money on the gold market, um, you know, possibly with information that was coming forward, but he didn't seem in any way um, nervous about it, as if he, it, it didn't seem as if he thought that he might you know, that someone might say, but that doesn't sound like a plausible story that you're, you know, that you, you, uh, he seemed more like a reporter who felt he had a scoop. 
And so if we look at what's going on with the gold market, you know, the, the at the in 1860, at the beginning of 1862, um, down at the bottom, we see like the connection between gold and the greenback and it's you know fairly closely aligned to what a hundred dollars worth of gold um would be uh and then if you get up to 1864 uh it's actually you know a tremendous difference between the value of gold and uh the dollar so someone betting on the gold market could definitely make a killing um and at, here's the graph showing how you know if favorable news from Mississippi would make gold go down and then, you know, other information would make it go up. Here's another picture of Wall Street. And here's showing you how closely aligned the telegraph office is with the gold market, that they're so close that, you know, a, a message from the telegraph can, can go right over to the gold floor to make a purchase. And one of the things that was going on, which I also had not really understood, was this kind of luxury living in New York City and, you know, all down the East Coast, actually throughout all the cities of the uh, country. Um, and, and people were buying luxury items and particularly people like Mary Todd Lincoln, who had at that point, she was she had what we would call now like she was a shopaholic and she uh, was she had spent way over her means and she confided to um one of her um staff members that she was in debt to the tune of around twenty six thousand dollars which was more than her husband's salary for the year um and she uh had written a letter just before uh this incident to the to the person who she owed the money to saying she would have the uh money to pay them back within a matter of weeks by the beginning of june Here's another image of the just the luxury luxury life there. So uh, so then we have to think, you know, uh, we got Joseph Howard out at Fort Lafayette, you know, and Abraham Lincoln has said he's treasonous and, you know, deserves all these punishments. Well, then there's going to be a trial where that's going to be uh, explored. But instead, uh, Joseph Howard uh, is actually just um, released. Uh, Reverend Henry Ward Beecher goes down to DC and pleads his case and Abraham Lincoln ends up letting Joseph Howard go. That would be strange enough given the strength of Lincoln's passions about this issue. But what makes it even weirder is soon after that, he gives uh, Joseph Howard a sinecure position within the uh, military the Union uh, Military Administration. So he becomes a reporter for the East, a reporter for the Department of the East, taking confessions of people sentenced to death. So he's given this extremely important position, you know, after having been, according to Lincoln, guilty of this terrible crime, which makes you wonder what exactly was going on. And the thing that it mirrors is a different incident that happened uh, earlier in his presidency where this, the, what, was, what we now know of as the State of the Union was leaked to a New York newspaper. And there was an investigation um, that ultimately pointed towards a, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. And she was about to be questioned about this issue. But at the time, their son was very tragically, uh, you know, suffering from what seems to be typhoid and he was basically on his deathbed so Abraham Lincoln goes to the Hill and he pleads that uh, the, the legislators back off and not question her, that he, as far as he knows, that there is no treasonous activity that his family members have participated in. And so instead, a gardener takes the fall for that particular leak and he ends up getting some punishment, but as soon as that punishment is over, he gets a sinecure position as a, you know, it working in the patent office. Now here we have another situation where, uh, you know, information uh, seems to be point uh, to uh, Mary Todd uh, because of the fact that there was, when we go into the archives of Abraham Lincoln, we find that on this exact same day as this 
false proclamation. Abraham Lincoln had signed a call, written out and signed a call up for 300,000 uh, Union soldiers, but he and he signed it, but he didn't send it. And so when he acted in such fury down in DC, it's likely because he realized that there was a leak from the White House. All of his subsequent actions uh, point to that because he he first goes to the War Department to find out if the information traveled over their wires. Then he sends uh, his agent and the military to the DC office to see if it went out over the independent telegraph wires. Again, if he thought it was just something made up out of whole cloth, he wouldn't have expected it to necessarily start in DC. It could have started in any imaginative mind across the Union. So he suspects a leak and all of the actions that carry forth from there um, are him then, you know, after expressing his fury, trying to sort of cover up the fact that this was something that came from the White House. So Joseph Howard, uh, it turns out, was a close confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln's. He, uh, you know, when he's talking about the proclamation before a week before it appears in the paper to, you know, just confiding to his fellow reporters and friends, he doesn't seem as if he's talking about something he's made up. It sounds as if he's got something that's a scoop. Uh, he goes and does his prison time. He is not tried. He is given, uh, he is released and he is given this, uh, you know, this nice assignment within the government. And I even found a letter where he says he, he's getting out of prison with a full uh, pardon, money in his pocket, and a story that will shock his friends. So I find it, um, you know, an interesting story to look at in terms of like, who is <laughs> Abraham Lincoln? I mean, there's, uh, it, it, it points to, first of all, the web of um, power that he is traveling, he is trying to, uh, you know, push his agenda through, you know, through the press, uh, through the thickets of activity on Wall Street, and then the more personal dramas that are happening for him, uh, you know, in his own White House. And ultimately, uh, and again, you'll have to sort of, <laughs> I don't have time to go into it now, but I would love to discuss it further with any of you. Um, and I am on social media, you can reach out that way um, if you like. But I mean, it speaks to this kind of uh, almost artistic in, uh, interpretation of the powers of the executive branch. Um, because throughout the entire story, we see him taking actions that are beyond the powers, someone having to push back. Um, and, you know, at one point, uh, there's a pushback so extreme that the New York governor uh, gets his attorney general to prosecute Abraham Lincoln's generals um, for their violations of constitutional rights of those newspaper editors. And so it becomes this, you know, very uh, celebrated, um, important legal fight within the New York courts about what is the role of the presidency, what is the limits on its power. So uh, anyhow, and if you were curious, um, Joseph Howard went on to a very illustrious career after all of this. Um, he, he ended up being the most well-paid journalist of, of the day. And actually his um, fabrications continued because when he is much older and Lincoln has, you know, been dead for decades, he writes a story that um, he was with Abraham Lincoln on his last night in Springfield uh, saying goodbye to Abraham Lincoln's books. It's a very touching, heartfelt story. And in my investigation, I found out that it's completely <laughs> untrue. It was, it was fabricated because I found that uh, Joseph Howard actually saw Lincoln for the very first time uh, when Abraham Lincoln is on day two of his uh, journey to his inaugural. So uh, Howard was not in Springfield with uh, Lincoln at all. So in any case, I thank you so very much for having me uh, to share this story with you. I would love to have further discussions and I'm uh, looking forward to the round table uh, tomorrow. Thank you.
Professor H.W. Brands is a phenomenally productive scholar, having published more than two dozen well-received books over the past three decades, including biographies of presidents, business leaders, and a founding father. Critics have praised his ability to combine expert storytelling with thoughtful interpretation that vividly renders major events through the lives of the chief participants. Professor Brands has also written extensively about American foreign policy and economic development, not to mention Texas history. In the Lone Star State, he serves on the faculty of the University of Texas in Austin, where he received his PhD in history. As one prominent reviewer of his latest book, The Zealot and the Emancipator, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, and the Struggle for American Freedom noted, Professor Brands takes exception to a view of Lincoln now in vogue, uh, in some quarters anyway, as a reluctant freedom fighter, a moderate politician who was devoted only to preserving the union until the vagaries of the Civil War forced his hand. In fact, Lincoln's hatred of slavery established early in his life ran deep. A native of Oregon, Professor Brands attended Stanford University, taught math at the high school level, and after receiving his PhD, taught history first at Vanderbilt and then Texas A&M before accepting his current appointment at the University of Texas, Austin. After writing biographies of Presidents Jackson, Grant, Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Franklin Roosevelt, he concluded, we have a cult of the president where we make too big a deal of the president. We in Springfield think he may be right about that, but with one conspicuous exception. Please join me in virtually welcome, welcoming Professor H. W. Brands. I wrote a book about John Brown and Abraham Lincoln because I wanted to answer a basic question of American history. But the question actually is bigger than American history. It's a question of, well, life in a civilized society. And the question is this, what does a good person do in the face of evil. What do you do when you see bad things going on around you? It's a question that emerges from time to time and probably every generation has to deal with it. I'm a little bit too young to have marched in the civil rights demonstrations, protests, marches of the 1960s, but I was old enough, I was in college, toward the tail end of the Vietnam War. And I participated in protests against the Vietnam War. I thought it was a misguided war. I thought it was downright wrong. And so I you know, marched. I don't think I carried any signs, but I marched and shouted and did that sort of thing. I also filed for and became a conscientious objector to the war. But you know, my simply opting out of the war didn't really end the war any sooner. I knew people. I knew people who were willing to engage in violent protests. I didn't know anybody who was willing to uh, set off a bomb to blow up something. I didn't know anybody who was willing to risk uh, harm to individual lives. I did know people who were willing to throw a brick through a window or maybe to start a fire under a police car or something like that. And, you know, I had to, I had to ask myself, is, is that right? I talked to them about it and they said, well, look, if Destroy, if breaking a window that costs $400 to fix is going to get us closer to the end of a war that is costing 400 lives every week or something like that, well, it's a small price to pay. And I thought about it, and I, I didn't come to exactly the same conclusion for myself, but I, 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 at least I understood where this decision was coming from. So anyway, these are questions that come up uh, in recent months in the United States in the last year. People have had to decide how to respond to the Black Lives Matter protests, to, to take part in them, to uh, march, to sign things, to perhaps engage in violent uh, protest, um, and in protest against uh, inequality of various other sorts, uh, police brutality, the whole thing. So these are questions that come up all the time. Um, on the other side, there are people evidently, who, have, who believe that the election, the presidential election was stolen by the Democrats and who were prepared to break laws and perhaps and indeed to inflict violence 
in hopes of overturning that decision. So anyway, these are, these are questions that come up all the time in a democracy. I guess they don't come up so much if you live under a monarch or under a dictator where individuals, they don't take part in the making of policy. But if you're involved in the making of policy, you know, in a democracy, even you know, your vote at the very least is part of the decision making process. These are questions you have to deal with. So it's a question that has intrigued me for a long time. And I decided to take it up in the context of the issue of slavery. And I wanted to identify and examine two people who agreed that slavery was wrong, but disagreed on what to do about it. And so I chose John Brown and Abraham Lincoln. But in telling their story, I had to examine the question of, well, who exactly, how many people, indeed in the United States, thought slavery was wrong? And the reason that this is of interest to me, I mean, it's of historical interest, of course, but I teach American history to 18 and 19 year olds, and, you know, up to graduate students too, but my big introductory class is mostly 18 and 19 year olds. And they have a very difficult time understanding a period in American history where not everybody agreed wholeheartedly that slavery was wrong. Now, needless to say, if you live in a democracy or even a functioning republic and everybody agrees that something is wrong, well, that something doesn't persist very long. You know, because as a democracy, you get to change the policies. So the fact that slavery persisted in the United States until the 1860s indicated that there was a substantial portion of the American population who thought that it was at least okay, maybe even in the context of it was, wrong, it was a necessary evil. And so I have, to, I have to try to take my students back to a time when people would see that. And in fact, and one of the things I point out that when John Brown was born in 1800, a lot of people in the country, not just in the South, but in the North as well, thought that slavery, well, North by 1800, let's go back to 1776. We'll start there with the Declaration of Independence. At that time, slavery was legal in every state, new states uh, of the Union. And most, most people didn't think it was a particularly big deal. If they thought about it at all, they thought, okay, it is not a good thing. It's one of those evils of life that you can't get away from. Benjamin Franklin identified death and taxes. They don't perhaps rise to the same, well, they're not quite in the same category. You can't avoid death. Presumably you can lower the tax if you want to. But there are lots of things in life at any time that people get kind of uncomfortable about. When I ask my students these days to imagine, so what are we doing? What are they doing? that their grandchildren will come to look on with disbelief. You know, how could you do such a thing? And one issue that comes up, the one, uh, one that often comes up is a question of global warming, climate change. And they imagine that their grandchildren will say, boy, you saw this coming and why didn't you do more about it? Maybe. Uh, another possibility is animal rights. And at the moment, Animals don't have much in the way of rights in American courts or in the courts of most countries, but it's not out of the question that one day they will. And if they do, and, and maybe this will come along with, I don't think it'll kind of happen if there's a universal, because there's universal conversion to veganism, I think it's more likely that scientists will figure out how to grow meat in a lab and so you can have a hamburger without having to kill a cow. And when that happens, then it will certainly be easier to say animals have rights. And then in that distant time, I don't know, 50 years from now, 40, maybe less, people look back on us and say, how could you tear apart dead animals with your teeth? And so anyway, in 1776, most Americans thought that slavery fell in the category of necessary evils. It's evil. I wouldn't want to be a slave myself. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't figure out how to run the economy of that, whether it's the economy of Virginia and in the 18th century still growing tobacco, the economy of Connecticut. Connecticut had a large tobacco industry. And a few places were starting to shift to cotton. But the thing was, this is the way the world works. And 
in terms of the morality of slavery, well, slavery was inherited from generations and millennia past, and there'd always been slavery, so I mean, that's the way it is. It's kind of like we've always eaten meat or we've always conducted war. No, war is another issue where people might say, if we figure out how to get along without war, people say, how could you do such a thing? How could you slaughter 40, 60 million people in World War II? What a horrible civilization you existed in. Anyway, so part of my story is the evolution of ideas on the morality of slavery. And John Brown and Abraham Lincoln are two cases in point. So John Brown was born in Connecticut. He grew up, however, in Ohio. And he, in Ohio, in the early 19th century, slavery was not legal. It never had been legal in Ohio, but it was legal across the Ohio River in Kentucky. And people who had slaves in Kentucky would bring their enslaved workers into Ohio. Sometimes they'd bring them for a while. If they were uh, driving a herd of cattle or something in, they'd bring the slaves in, and nobody really thought much of it. John Brown grew up seeing white people working in fields and black people working in fields. And he saw you know, white people doing you know, manual labor and black people doing manual labor. And he didn't really think much about the difference between the two. He was too young to sort of understand concepts of ownership. But there was um, a day when he was maybe eight or nine years old. He remembered this in later years when he, when he became somewhat notorious and people wanted to know about the origin and evolution of, of his views on slavery. And John Brown said, uh, described a moment when he was, he was playing with this other kid. And this other kid happened to be a, a black boy. And the two were playing as boys do, and John Brown didn't think much of it one way or the other. Until, after they'd been playing a while, this man, a white man, came up and started yelling at the, the black boy. And then started beating him around the, the head and shoulders. And John Brown was mystified by this at first. He, he recalled, he said, yeah, I'm really puzzled, what's going on? And then it was explained to him what the relationship was between this guy who was the kid's owner and the kid himself. And then it hit home to John Brown that, well, wait, this kid, my playmate, is in a different situation than I am. Nobody gets to beat me around the head like that. And, you know, I, his father probably could legally, but his father didn't. But, um, and, and so John Brown recognized in a kind of a personal way, I'm here and this boy is here and I'm in a different world because he's a slave and I'm not. So it began to nag at John Brown. And he began to ask himself what he could do to, to deal with this. And basically, he has concluded that slavery is wrong. But that's only a first step. The question is, what do you, John Brown, do about it? Now, John Brown, nine years old, nine-year-old kids don't do much of, you know, of anything along those lines. But as he got older, he began thinking about it. He began wrestling with this problem more and more. And he, the community he lived in in Ohio uh, was, there were a growing number of people who were opposed to slavery. It's really only by the time John Brown gets to be about 30 or so that what you would call an abolitionist movement develops in the United States. And he happened to live in a town of Hudson, Ohio, where there are a lot of abolitionists by the mid 1830s. But John Brown remembered and people remembered about John Brown that there was a moment when a realization came to him. He had this epiphany. And it occurred in 1837. Elijah Lovejoy, an abolitionist editor, had just been murdered by a mob. And John Brown thought, uh, you know, this is, this is where the, the path, the road forks. Because until this time, John Brown had been a fairly moderate, fairly mild-mannered opponent of slavery. But he wouldn't have called himself a full-blown abolitionist in the sense that slavery is so evil it must end right now. But the murder of Elijah Lovejoy caused John Brown to stand up in his church in Hudson, Ohio, and declare to the congregation, declare before the eyes of God, that he was going to devote the rest of his life to the fight against slavery, against this evil thing. So this is, this is John Brown. Now, it's probably significant for John Brown's story, maybe not so significant for the broader question of what does the good person do in the face of evil.
But it's probably significant for John Brown's story that John Brown never really was a success at much of anything. He was a, a good-hearted person. He was able and willing to work hard. But the pieces of life just didn't fit together very well, with one, one important exception. John Brown was really good at having children. He had 20 kids, 20 kids by, by two wives. One of the first one died. And, but other than that, I mean, John Brown had to figure out how to support this family, and he just wasn't very good at it. He tried his hand at farming, and that didn't go well. And he tried his hand at various kinds of business. He had a cattle business. He you know, was you know, this kind of business, that kind of business. He raised sheep. He just did one thing and another, and it just didn't work. Now, I'm sure that somebody else in John Brown's circumstances could have made it work, but he didn't have that sort of methodical approach to life. He didn't, well, I guess he didn't have the desire, the ambition to make something of himself, at least not in that way. And so this is John Brown. He got involved in the, the anti-slavery movement. He, he assisted with the Underground Railroad, helping escaped slaves to, to make their way to freedom in Canada. But he still, he still just couldn't quite figure out how to, how to make things work. He moved his family, this is no small thing, he moved his family to what amounted to um, an African-American colony in upstate New York. It had been funded by some abolitionist philanthropists. And the idea was to give land and give tools and opportunity to free African-Americans so that they could demonstrate, first of all, they could improve their lives themselves, but so they could demonstrate that they were just as competent in the world. They could become as successful as white people because by the 1840s, it was fairly common for slave owners and their apologists in the South, and by this time it's entirely in the South, to say that slaves just aren't fit. They, they can't uh, tend to themselves. They need the patriarchal hand of slave masters and so on. And so this colony at North Elba in upstate New York was designed to give the lie to this. And John Brown participated in this. And, and he was well liked by his neighbors. He was respected by his neighbors. And it was striking to even the neighbors there, even, even in the abolitionist community, to treat black people with sort of full respect and equality. That was unusual. There were a lot of abolitionists who looked upon slaves, black people, as kind of their personal project but not somebody that they would ever you know, live next door to. But John Brown seemed to have that very uh, colorblind, egalitarian streak in his personality, and so people respected him for this. But still, but still he, he, hadn't, he hadn't found his mission in life, and that's gonna come in a moment. So we'll get back to that. So my other character is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln grew up around slavery as well. He was born in Kentucky. And he spent much of his childhood and in, in young manhood in Indiana. And Kentucky, a slave state, and Indiana and then Illinois, are, these are border states, and slaves that, states that border the slave territory. And so he was fully aware of what the existence of slavery was. One of the reasons the family, Lincoln's father, moved the family out of Kentucky was that he didn't want to have to compete himself with unpaid slave labor, and presumably he didn't want his son to have to do it either. Which raises an interesting, an interesting kind of ambivalence on the part of various people among whites regarding slavery. Because there were, there was a certain strain of thought among white workers, we'll call them sort of working class people, manual laborers, that okay, we don't like to be around slaves, we don't like slavery, because it tends to depress the wage scale. Because slaves get paid just a minimal subsistence wage, in effect, and we don't want our wages driven down to that subsistence level. But on the other hand, white workers were not universally enthusiastic about freeing slaves, because then, all of a sudden, these slaves, slave labor, they're going to become free labor and compete directly with them. As long as they were slaves, they competed sort of indirectly. White workers often did different things than slave workers did. But if they became free workers, then they could actually compete for the jobs that the white workers had. So there was an ambivalence in this. And, 
And so Lincoln's family, Lincoln himself, was kind of part of this ambivalent thing. They didn't like slavery, but it was for a variety of reasons, not entirely moral. With, um, with Lincoln, with Lincoln, the moral epiphany comes when he is living in Indiana and he hires out to take a flatboat of cargo to New Orleans, float it down the Ohio River and then down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. And the standard practice, somebody had a cargo they wanted to sell, they would build a flatboat and they would hire somebody like Lincoln, I think he was 19 years old or something like this, and off he'd go down the river. And when he got to New Orleans, and flat boats aren't really hard to manage, when he got to New Orleans, he would sell the cargo and he would break up the flatboat, sell it for lumber, and then he'd find his way back home. Lincoln went to New Orleans, and for the first time in his life, he saw the operation of the slave system. No longer was he just seeing slaves out in the field. Now, now he was seeing enslaved peoples put on the auction block and sold just the way horses or cattle would be sold. And for Lincoln, this really encapsulated the degradation that slavery inflicted upon those who were caught in its grasp. And it really gave the lie in Lincoln's mind to what the United States was supposed to be about. Again, as with John Brown, when you saw enslaved workers and free workers just working kind of side by side, and you know, they go home and they go home, and you don't really notice that much different. But Lincoln knew perfectly well that there was no place in the United States where white people were put on the auction block and were, you know, bang, you know, off you go. Uh, so slavery had that very degrading, demeaning quality. And Lincoln, Lincoln thought, okay, this, this crosses my line. And this is crucial when I get back to this basic question. So what does the good person do in the face of evil? There comes a point when that person, whoever that person is, you, me, anybody else, where some line is crossed and you decide, I gotta take action, I have to do something. Okay, so we've got John Brown and Abraham Lincoln to the point in their lives, respectively, where they decide they have to do something. But what is that something? That's the question. This is, this is my fundamental question. So I had to choose two people who agreed, in my case, that slavery was wrong. Because if I had somebody who thought, you know, okay, slavery is wrong, and somebody else who think that slavery is okay, John Calhoun, let's say, on this side. Well, John Calhoun would say, we don't have to do anything about slavery, because it's fine. Now, for my question, what do you do in the face of evil? I gotta have a, an experiment where two people agree on the evil, but then they differ on what to do about it. So, John Brown, Abraham Lincoln, think that slavery is evil. But that's, that's, that's the easy question. It's the easy part. We conclude that it's wrong. The hard part is, what do you do about it? John Brown decided that slavery was so evil, and I have to say, that because John Brown was not involved in politics, was not a lawyer, was not particularly well educated, John Brown, for example, uh, would not have thought of running for office on an anti-slavery platform or anything like that. This was just beyond his imagination, beyond his capabilities. So he decided that he would take direct action, but he still didn't know quite what that direct action was until for both man, Brown and Lincoln, there's a trigger that sets them on the path that they're going to wind up traveling, and that is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 overturned a key aspect of the settlement that was known as the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that said, at least in this part, that said that the territory, the northern part of the old Louisiana Purchase, which at the time was half of the United States, the, the northern part of that will be forever off limits to slavery. The southern part can be slave in due course, but the, the northern part is always going to be off limits to slavery. And at the time, there was still this belief among many people that if slavery could simply be contained, then it would eventually die of its own weight. And there, there was a logic to this, and this logic goes all the way back to George Washington in the 18th century by, well actually by the 1790s, George Washington had concluded that 
plantation agriculture, as it had been handed down to him, was not uh, going concern for very long. That tobacco in particular, tobacco was the, the big cash crop and had been since the early 1600s, so you know, for almost two centuries. But it had worn out the soil. And so Washington got out of the business of being what you would call really a planter. And he shifted into growing wheat and crops that were grown in the north. Now this is actually very important because these crops like wheat are crops that don't require, in fact, don't even favor an enslaved workforce. Because an enslaved workforce is by its nature a very unflexible workforce. With wheat, you just plant, the wheat, you plow, you plant, you walk away and you come back four or five months later and you harvest it. But in the meantime, there's not much for the workers to do. So what you want if you're growing wheat is a workforce that you can hire for three weeks here and then tell them to go away and then come back uh, four months later and we'll hire you for two weeks and there you go. Tobacco, by contrast, is a crop that requires tending sort of almost year round. So this was, this was where Washington thought things were going. Now, in fact, they didn't quite go that way because of the introduction of cotton and the invention of the cotton gin that made the, the processing of cotton more efficient and therefore more profitable. So, so, but anyway, George Washington realized that plantation, oh, by the way, I should say, say that cotton never became as big a deal in Virginia as it would say in Mississippi and Alabama and Texas and Arkansas. And it was for this reason that by the 1840s and 1850s, especially by the 1850s, slavery was unprofitable in Virginia simply as a means of growing crops. What made slavery still profitable in Virginia and some of those older states was the market for new slaves in places like Texas and Arkansas and Mississippi and Louisiana. So for Eastern slave owners, there was this strong incentive, almost an imperative, to expand. We have to expand slavery in order to make it profitable for us. Anyway, so what the Kansas-Nebraska Act does is overturn this idea that slavery will be contained. No, no, now slavery is going to expand. So this causes John Brown to take up arms. John Brown takes up arms against slavery in the phenomenon known as bleeding Kansas. And he goes to Kansas with his adult sons. And he takes part in what amounts to the guerrilla war going on there. And John Brown leads a small band, including a couple of his sons, on what amounted to a murder mission. John Brown and this small group of men, they dragged five pro-slavery settlers out of their homes in the dark of night and brutally murdered them, hack them to death with broadswords as a message to other pro-slavery settlers who might be coming to Kansas in the hopes of making Kansas a state, Kansas now a territory, make Kansas a slave state when the time comes. So John Brown has really, he's really crossed a line. He's gone to the point where his convictions about the evil of slavery have made him believe that essentially anything is justified in the battle against slavery. John Brown would go on from there to launch a raid on Harper's Ferry, which would make him nationally known, world known. The raid failed. The point of the raid, however, was to arm slaves who would rise up against their masters and would fight violently for their freedom. John Brown was willing to kill people, and he was willing to start a war, which would lead to the deaths of many other people, because he thought that slavery was so wrong, so evil. And this is, this is John Brown's answer to the question, what does the good man do against the evil of slavery? That's John Brown. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is energized by the same Kansas-Nebraska Act. Lincoln had been in politics before, but he got back into the lawyering business. But the Kansas-Nebraska Act bought, brought him back into politics because he thought, oh my gosh, now that that barrier against the expansion of slavery has gone away, then good people, anti-slavery people, need to take strong action. But for Lincoln, the violent action that John Brown was willing to take was not only wrong in its own right, but it was counterproductive. What Lincoln believed, Lincoln followed Henry Clay, what Lincoln called his beau ideal, the statesman, his hero, his model, how a politician should act. 
Henry Clay had believed, and Lincoln believed after him, that slavery would be ended when Southerners came to the same conclusion that Northerners had come to in the previous decades, that slavery no longer suited them, that it was either no longer profitable or that it was not profitable enough to overcome the, the moral qualms they had about it. Lincoln concluded that in contrast to Brown's violent action against slavery, the solution was a patient but firm approach through politics. Lincoln was a constitutionalist. Lincoln revered the Constitution. Many abolitionists, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Many abolitionists despised the Constitution. They scorned the Constitution. They said basically it's what guarantees slavery. But Lincoln believed that the Constitution was what guaranteed America's freedom, the freedoms of all Americans. Lose the Constitution and the freedoms of all Americans are going to be at risk. This was Lincoln's conclusion. So Lincoln insisted on charting a political path. And Lincoln understood that slavery would not end in the United States until the Constitution was amended. The Constitution, in Lincoln's interpretation, that of nearly everybody else, guaranteed the existence of slavery in the states where it existed. And the only way to end slavery was as it had been ended in the North state by state, or conceivably you could amend the Constitution, but that would be almost as hard. But that's the way it would have to happen. This was Lincoln's view. So Lincoln charted this moderate path, and it got him eventually the nomination of the Republican Party. It got him elected president, at which point it began to appear that his moderate path was not going to happen because in response to his election, of course, the South, uh, 11 ultimately southern states secede, and Lincoln then is faced with a war to hold to bring or hold the Union together. And in the consequence of this, emancipation sort of pops out. It's a side effect of Lincoln's attempt to hold the Union together. So there's an irony here in that John Brown tried to start a war to free the slaves, and he failed. His war didn't get going, and it didn't free any slaves. Lincoln tried to avoid a war, believing that it was, it was important to, to, to honor the Constitution and to do this peacefully. He didn't avoid the war, and the war is what wound up being the engine of emancipation. So that's my story. I believe we're going to have a chance to talk about this in, when we have our conversation, so uh, we'll have more to say about it then.